Hello and welcome to the business podcast at Imperial College Business School. I am your host, Amin Siala, and today my guest is Patrick Lynch. Patrick Lynch is the founder and CEO of Texuna, a company founded in the year 2000. That's the year 2000 that um, works in the data warehousing space. Um, Patrick is also an investor in a variety of, of companies, both technological uh, and in other industries, including Allison, uh, Educate, which is in the uh, educational sphere, as you could guess, um, companies like Indemo, which are in the mobile ethnography space, which I'll be asking him about, um, security interests in there. And he's also recently gone into the world of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, um, which obviously we'll be finding out more of soon. And last but not least, he also has interests in South American um, metal businesses, mining interests, which is which is just just so interesting and, and I guess so different from the rest of your technological data focused platform SaaS businesses, which which will be interesting. Firstly, Patrick, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. So you're sporting a Texuna T-shirt today. I don't want to let the side down. All right. <laughs> Why don't you tell us what Texuna is? Um, Texuna is a, a business that myself and some friends had set up. Um, we were working together in an investment bank here in London, UBS Warburgs, and um, a, a bunch of us had met uh, through the graduate training program. So we'd been in the United States with UBS, hmm. um, had spent some time together and just got to know each other very, very well. And when uh, this was around the year 2000, uh, a lot of us in the technology side of things were getting a bit bored hearing about Y2K, which is what happens when you know computers from the 70s, 80s and 90s clocked over to requiring uh, four digits for the year instead of two digits. Right. So this is a huge story created by the industry about uh, new investment to make sure your computers didn't break. Not sure if anybody in your podcast will remember those days. <laughs> so uh, at that time, uh, the... Uh, internet boom and the dot-com boom was uh, in full flow and we had an opportunity to get out and uh, do our own startup. We got some backing from, there's a story behind it actually, um, a friend of mine Ian Monk had set up a, a, a game called Soccer Bank. Soccer Bank. Soccer Bank, which was a virtual game for trading virtual shares in football players. Hmm. And um, he had been looking for funding for that. And uh, one of the potential investors said, no, 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 I have no interest in any of that. But can you guys build a, a commodity trading platform? So that's where TechSuna came from. Right. OK. So in essence, then, because right now there's a booming industry for fantasy games, mm -hmm. uh, fantasy football, billions, worth in the billions. Actually, one of the top ones is a Scotland based company, in fact. And you had the idea of that or one of your colleagues or partners had an idea for that in the year 2000? Yeah. So in those days, Ian Monk was working on something called WAP. Um, okay. W-A-P-P? W-A-P. Okay. Can't even remember what it stands for anymore. <laughs> um, but basically, it was the precursor to internet on your phone. And um, oh. he was working with some front uh, office traders in the bank, and they wanted to be able to trade from their phone when they were out of the office. Um so he took that idea around stock trading and applied it into a new area and, and, and designed this fantasy football game. Right. And it came from, or it imitated a previous game um, called the Hollywood Stock Exchange, which was doing exactly the same thing, but around actors and actresses in Hollywood. Has that succeeded, though? I feel like... The Soccer Bank? No, or so the Hollywood the Exchange. Hollywood, Hollywood Exchange. Uh, I haven't watched it. In, yeah. I, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. No, that was uh, a long time ago. I am aware that quite a few people have actually tried to get into to that industry where you commoditize individuals or celebrities and try to trade their value up and down. But in your case, uh, you had an investor that said, no, I'm not that interested in that, but can you do a commodity trading platform instead? Yeah. And did you say yes? Of course. <laughs> okay, right. Tell us about what happened next. So we set up Texuna um, with uh, four or five guys that came out of banking and with a, an investor who had a, a, a big history and background in trading commodities. It was particularly strong in the cotton trade, believe it or not. So uh, we ended up building a, a platform for allowing you to manage trade documents and to do or conduct trade online mm. uh, without having to go through an old fashioned fax machine based approach of, of sending offers and bids and uh, yeah. contracts backwards so, and forwards. So in even in these days, people didn't use email a lot. You know, a lot of international commodity traders who travel the world 
um, might have had AOL on a dial-up modem. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they'd send simple mes- messages and emails and then they'd have to have a fax to do business via fax because right. fax was an acceptable standard, whereas email was not in terms of doing trades. So you went from investment banking to technology. So I was in, uh, let's take another step back. Um, I came out of university. I spent seven years in university in Cork in Ireland. And I have a background in economics and information systems in my Uh. primary degree. And um, I had I did a master's in information systems and specialized in data warehousing. Right. So I looked at the business angle of data warehousing. So I looked at um, the balance scorecard, Kaplan and Nolan balance scorecard, um, and how you could deliver that for a large organization. And um, as a result, I ended up investigating what's called OLAP, online analytical processing, mm-hmm. and data warehousing. So that's uh, one of the reasons I went into UBS was because I was very interested in financial markets and okay. economics anyway, but also I was very interested in technology and data and how the data applied to business. Right. Um, so when I went to UBS Warburgs, I worked as a systems analyst and I worked on a large data warehousing project there as my first project. Got it. So you've been in the data game, so to speak, from the year 2000 up until today. Today we're at 2018. Yeah. And you must have seen things change. Uh, some things change. Some things don't change at all. Right. What are the things that don't change? Why don't we start with fundamentals? Data quality. So data is crap or rubbish all the time. It's very hard. It takes a big investment for people to get data right. And normally it depends on people and their behavior. So uh, it is a hard job. Nobody likes doing it. Right. But someone has to. Someone has to. And I get, take it you've had a variety of clients through the year, primarily focused on the education sector. So right? when the dot-com burst came in the year 2000 um, bust yeah. rather than burst <laughs> let's say uh, we had to find a new business our investor decided to walk away and um, you know we, we had to try and figure out were we going to walk away and, and let the business fold or were we going to change our story and try and do something else so we had a body of IPR in terms of technology for managing data and documents And we decided that um, electronic patient records was a a sector that needed a shake up. Hmm. You know, again, this is very early in the Internet days. There weren't a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. So we um, repurposed and repackaged what we were doing into an electronic patient record system. And we won a number of pilot projects uh, for primary care trusts at the time and started rolling that out. That went really, really well for a little while. Wow. And then... After that, did you continue in the health space? So then the government created a national program for information technology. Okay. And they sliced the country up into five pieces and awarded five mega contracts to some mega providers to do electronic patient records and create a spine for sharing data between different PCTs and acute hospitals and so on. Right, right. So that was game over for us in electronic patient records pretty much within a year of us having started rolling out stuff. Is that when the jump to education came in? So then we had to go searching for the third time for a, a new business, a new, new area where yeah. we, we thought we could get ahead. And um, we came across a publicly um, published tender mm. on OJU, so under the European Union, large tenders need to be published. So we came across this tender for what was called the teacher training agency at the time. Uh, and they spend, you know, over a billion a year um, finding and training new teachers. Wow. And as part of that, they have a statutory obligation to publish reports back to parliament and publicly to the sector. So the incumbents that were running that were using Microsoft uh, Access and floppy disks. Okay. So we thought that, you know, it'd be far easier if you did this over the internet. Um, so we applied for our first public tender and we won it. What year was that in? That was about 13 years ago. So it was about oh. 2004, 2005. So 2004, 2005, uh, you were part of a project where you had to switch four clients going from floppy disk to the internet. Yeah. So all universities used to put their data on a floppy disk and send it back to the supplier that was responsible for collating it all together. Yeah. Wow. Now, before we just delve in deeper it, into the it technology. It wasn't a hard sell. The, the customer was very anxious and eager <laughs> to try and, you know, shake things up and, and do new things. So, right. Um, they pro- they're public sector and they're notoriously conservative. And we were just a, a bunch of guys 
uh, who I look young today, but I look very young back that time. <laughs> and, um, you know, they would have been really, really afraid, but they were so anxious to encourage change. Right, right. And I suppose they were pretty convinced that uh, we had done a number of things reasonably well, including patient record systems. So they, they were uh, satisfied, I guess, on the, on the security of the data aspect. They obviously knew that we came from a banking background as well. Mm. So... I think they took a big risk, and, and that's basically where Taxuna came from in terms of its business today. So from your perspective, I guess what's interesting for listeners potentially is that it wasn't that you just guess, stumbled across one vertical and pursued that. There was a lot of pivots through the way. Yeah. Is that is that what one should expect? I think if, you, um, if young people set up a business, it's pretty clear that they don't really know what they're doing, so they have to okay. learn as they go and, and learn to be dynamic and change. The big thing I learned is that government and policy has a huge impact on what does and doesn't work. Mm. Um, But also, I think that uh, all big successful tech companies are relatively paranoid because the difference between super success and minor success and failure can be quite small. So, you know, it's the difference between MySpace versus Facebook and so on. You know, it's the little things and getting the little things right, including timing. You know, for example, Soccer Bank. Probably 15 years too early. 15 years too early. And yeah. so had it been launched today? Because you must remember in those days, you know, you didn't have more than one phone per head of population, you know, in mm. those days and paying for data connections and stuff like Expensive. that. You know, it just, it wasn't there. Now, amazingly, we tried to sell the game to uh, William Hill and they called us the baby face bandits. Wow. <laughs> uh, because they thought we were asking for too much. Right. But they were genuinely interested and it was by far and away, one of the most stickiest pieces of content on the internet at the time. So people who um, got involved in playing the game used to play it for like five or six hours a week. A week? It was a very, very sticky game in those days, yeah. Wow, and I mean, with those metrics, more or less, today, that that would have been acquired. Ah, today, you would imagine it would be a thousand times bigger in terms of the size. Yeah. Well, But anyway, you know, everything in life is about timing. Timing, luck, government policy... Uh, and what the environmental conditions are, mm. um, are extremely important to a story and, and telling a story and getting backing for that story. Yeah, yeah, that, that is fascinating. I think, uh, uh, you know, another interesting thing is that the fact that you've been involved in such a variety of projects and, and, and almost industries as well. So I guess, how how do you maintain focus? Um, I, I don't want to pretend there's a grand design or a grand scheme behind it, but you, right. you do keep your eyes open and within a certain framework of understanding the world, when something comes on your radar that you like, you obviously, I look at it more closely. Educate is a good example of some of the stuff I've just been talking about. Yeah. Uh, I don't think educate would work if government policy, um, or certainly I don't think they would have started as well as they did if government policy was different. So right now, um, government put um, well over a billion pounds, I think it's over two billion pounds per annum, Mm -hmm. into pupil premium. What is pupil premium? Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but it's effectively a top up for um, uh, students in areas that need more support or in schools that need more support. Um, So the government makes this money available, but it's very, very difficult to create an investment argument as to why that money should be made available. Um, There are two pieces of data you can look at. One is the change in academic performance as a result of spending this money. And the second thing is uh, the change in student well-being. Right. So this is an area that Educate have focused on and uh, Taxuna helped them with this. Um, so this is one of your many investments, obviously. You've got, you've got also Allison. What's, what's Allison do? So Allison is an online e-learning platform. Mm. Uh, it's one of the first, uh, I can't say traditional because, uh, well, it's, it's nearly 10 years old, so I probably can't say uh, a MOOC, a massive open online course. Yep. Uh, it's very, very focused on, it's free learning for everybody worldwide. Okay. And they're, they're very focused on kind of workforce or work-based um, uh, units of study. Okay. Uh, because it's free, it has to develop a business model around advertising in one hand, and you have the, the option to purchase a certificate at the end of your studies if you wish. Oh. Um, it's only English language. Uh, it's only raised about a million euro. But in the last 10 years, they've built up a business with over 11 million uh, wow. registered learners. Yep. They've graduated over one and a half million students from their platform. It's phenomenal. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it runs as a nice little business. Yeah. 
its competitors would be people like edX, Udacity, Coursera, uh, even Lynda.com before it got bought by by LinkedIn. Wow. All of those businesses have raised over a hundred million dollars in funding, and I think most of them are probably valued at over a billion dollars. Yeah, Allison is is a, a a little business that has only raised a million dollars to date. So I think if you watch this space for the next year or two, you might find some uh, exciting developments ahead. We'll keep our eyes open. So let's go back to Educate. Um, I think we jumped into Educate there. What, what does Educate do? So initially, Educate started out as a, a kind of a directory of services so that schools could easily find the types of service providers that will give programs back to the school in return for this pupil funding. So pupil funding would go to these third party providers who could um, bring sports programs to the schools or leadership programs or whatever yeah. else it might be. Um, so Educate created a directory and uh, allowed some information sharing between the schools and the service providers. Um, and the idea was to be able to help provide an economic justification for why mm. this made sense. So mm. if you spend this much money on uh, different activities in the school, what impact will that have on academic performance? Yeah. But also um, they've introduced the idea of well-being surveys. So they are now a leader in the UK in terms of uh, well-being surveys for students and trying to focus on how well the students themselves are doing as individuals rather mm. than just the academic aspect. A big part of this sounds to me like there is an attempt here to try to capture the data, but uh, I guess reproduce it in yeah. a more understandable manner, an actionable manner. So in the UK, um, the, there's a, a quasi-laissez-faire right. approach by government. So they don't want to come in. Um, some of this depends on uh, who leads the country at different times, right? So I think from the Labour government, uh, there was a big push to create good, strong, centralised IT systems to gather data, and they had a good understanding of the value of data. I think in a Conservative government, uh, they really understand the value of the data, but they don't want to be seen as the orchestrator of, of stuff, so they leave it more open to market forces, maybe. And that's where we are now. So I think Educate is okay. an example of a business that has stepped in. Right. And, you know, rather than having a big centralized government data warehouse sucking student data, well, they do this anyway, right, but at a different level. But yep. what Educate do is they, um, in a free market, you know, they work with, um, with schools to give them what they want, and they take student data from their systems and help uh, package that in a way that schools understand better what they're doing and how they compare to the sector in general. So, yeah, it is very much a data focused, big data play. With regards to, to your investment into Educate, what was it that interested you? Was it the fact that it was in the education space? Was it the concept or was it just a variety of factors? So almost accidentally, <laughs> um, you can see that Texuna has a strong background in education. Right. And it's not because... Uh, the majority of our people are education specialists. Uh, we're really engineering and data specialists. Mm. Um, we do have, obviously, a lot of education know-how. We understand the education sector and the data and some of the people and policies and strategies and so on. But fundamentally, the real reason... So we have a strength and we like to play to that. So yep. uh, we were, we've done uh, projects at a central government level for the Department for Education and with some arm's length bodies. I mentioned the teacher training agency earlier. They're now called the, Nas uh, the NCTL, National College for Teaching and Leadership. Yep. So they went through a few mergers. So we've got a lot of know-how in the, the kind of centralized part of the education space. Right. Um, we've started more recently to work with universities around data warehousing, data management, because we've collected data from them for over 10, 12 years. Um, and Educate was an opportunity for us to start looking at schools and academies. Mm, um, so right. it's, a, it's a way of getting to know more data at a different level and at, maybe at an earlier stage. So we're looking at primary schools and secondary schools. Yeah. Texuna also run what used to be called Edubase. Um, today it's called Get Information Ac um, About Schools, GIAS. Okay. Um, so that's kind of uh, what the, the, the GDS call a... Um, a data registry, so it's a, a list of the de facto master data list of all schools right. in England. That's uh, that's Educate there then. Um, so that was a way Educate was a way of us using our know how um, and understanding of schools yeah. and developing further with Educate to look at schools data and aggregating that schools data. I mean, it, it makes sense as a strategy. Yeah, it's it's yeah. something that you understood well and it, it was going to be complementary. Yeah, yeah, we can bring a, a lot of know-how. So we have specific know-how in terms of big data, cloud and data management and data quality yeah. uh, and the service aspect of that. So the one thing I didn't explain earlier maybe is that TechSoon don't normally sell software. 
So even though we're very good at software engineering and we've got a big open source background and so on, we don't actually sell software. So a lot of what we do are around services. Mm. Um, the NCTL business we've been running for 12 or 13 years, and that's a business where we took responsibility for collecting the data and doing the statutory reporting. Okay. So we didn't sell some software for them to use and operate themselves. We built an automated platform that allowed us to do the collection across all universities in, in the sector yep. and then uh, do the statutory reporting for this body, the NCTL. So on this point, actually, I'm just going to take a, just going a bit of a tangent there. Um, we can't speak to a data expert and ask him the question about big data, one of the big buzzwords. Without asking that, that question. That yeah. we hear today. Why don't you tell us, what is big data? I think it depends who's selling it. Um, right. uh, I think you can look at data in two ways. Uh, when people talk about big data, um, the I think today's understanding of big data and like the really massive um, data that uh, most digital businesses are familiar with are about sometimes relatively simplistic data sets that are massive in scale. So it's not complex data, it's just huge volumes. Now, why would you have big volumes of data? If you're a relatively large um, web enterprise, mm -hmm. and for example, if you decided to collect the data on how a mouse pointer might move across the screen for all your customers, okay. uh, and you collect that click stream, it's a relatively simple data set in terms of understanding you know, what is what is each row of data, yep. but it's potentially colossal. It could be millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions or, or more. Okay. So I think in the, the advent of big data uh, and the technologies used to support big data were for relatively simplistic data sets that were absolutely massive in scale. Uh, and this comes back into data warehousing a little bit because trying to get value out of data has always um, been a struggle between hardware and software and the algorithms that you design to run on hardware and software yep. to be able to get the insights that you want. So there was uh, lots of optimization to try and figure out how to do that. Why do you think there's such uh, there's so much media attention going into big data and cloud? So because it's a business, right? So uh, it's a brand name that makes it simple to understand a generic set of services that people want to sell. Right. So what's happening is that big data is going from relatively simple data collection at a massive scale mm. to being a, a magic solution to help you sort out any kind of data. Right. So actually big data in many cases is selling big data related technologies to small data problems. So you yep. could still have millions of records, but it's small data ultimately. But that small data could be very, very complex. So you could have dozens and dozens of source systems. Um, and the, the magic is trying to figure out how to interrelate all of these sources of data, make the data match, mm. so that you can start getting a much bigger picture of what's really going on. So that's the real hard part. That's where you have issues with data quality. You have to try and figure out how to clean it up to make better matches between data and then make better decisions based on that data. Right. So on this point, then, do you get involved with the analytical side of things? Because companies now nowadays have millions of pieces of data and there's almost too much for them to handle. And what do they do with it? Is, do you get involved in that stage? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I can give you a specific example. We've worked with JISC. Um, JISC is an amalgamation of three businesses. One is, is the traditional JISC uh, academic research business, let's say. So they had an R&D business um, where universities in the sector here in the UK would put funds together and do future R&D for the sector, you know, what is good in terms of digital technologies and so on. Uh, they had a digital resources business very much focused on libraries and uh, academic papers and uh, getting access to all of this digital content. And they had the Janet Network, which is uh, basically the internet backbone across all of the universities here. Okay. So these businesses came together and we won a, a project to help put a data warehouse in place to help them integrate these different businesses and all of the data sources that they had to get better management information. Um, and as part of that, in a traditional data warehousing type of project, you've kind of three stages. One is how do you integrate the data? Mm. The second one is how do you store and manage that data in a format that makes it easier to understand. Right. And then the third bit is how do you do the business intelligence and the analytics um, for these guys? So yeah, yeah we, we helped them in each of those steps of the process. And in the integration bit, a lot of the big data technology today 
focuses on first getting the information from various sources, so extract the data, and then you load it somewhere mm. onto cheap storage on the cloud or in-house. Yep. Uh, and then when it's there, you lastly do some transformations or cleaning. So that's called ELT, extract, load, and transform. Okay. In the older days, you would typically extract transform it mm -hmm. in the data pipeline and then load it into a warehouse. So some of the distinction between big data technology uh, and more traditional data warehousing technology is that idea of that, you know, let's not bother cleaning up the data. Let's just take it from various sources, put it into a huge pool, a data lake or object storage, which is really, really cheap. Mm -hmm. And then as and when we want to use it or analyze it, we can start cleaning it and structuring it and putting it into a reporting warehouse or something like that. Okay, can we put that in the context of a company like Uber, for example? So they have they are what they are around the world in hundreds of cities, and they are I'm guessing collating all the data on on everything that's happening on the platform. What is the process for them, data wise? So, what people need to understand is that there are some behemoths in the digital industry, and they have very very specialized requirements. So. They're not like the vast majority of businesses or, or mm. um, enterprise in the world. Um, so you're talking about very, very specialist okay. um, folks. But in their case, yeah, they'll have loads of streaming data. So think of a mobile phone with an app on it as a, an Internet of Thing yep. device that streams lots of data. So they have a very, very optimized system where they take streaming data off of these um, local platforms or devices like mobiles. Uh, and then they have to design a special database table. So uh, in data, relational databases and normalization were a way of structuring data so that you could be absolutely sure that it was correct. In these kind of very, very hyper-optimized um, organizations, they don't use those databases in that way. Mm. They use NoSQL databases because it's easier and faster to write stuff in. Um, NoSQL allows you to put in unstructured data, but in the case of Uber, they create a certain amount of structure and they stick unstructured data into different parts of that structure uh, and then they never modify it. So this database that they create just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, okay. so records are version managed, so they always know that the latest version of that um, record is, like they look for the latest version and always read the data from that. Yeah. So they've got a good history, but they never go back and try and change or update the data in an old record. So it's a different way of looking at how you stream data. Uh, and I think they're very good because lots of normal businesses that are much smaller would typically create a relational database system and they'll have transactions and they'll update the transactions and they'll keep the database up to date. Huge digital data organizations like Uber cannot, the technology isn't really uh, fast enough to be able to manage the, the streaming data that, that those platforms Right, produce. okay, so on that point. So they have to do it very differently. Right, so they have to, do, they have to create a bespoke solution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's totally bespoke. Okay, and this is why they probably need to recruit talent in and they'd have to figure it in-house. So all of these guys have to have amazing engineering talent to be able to figure out not just how to make a solution, but how can you um, uber-optimize it, yeah. I'd say. It is very, very specialist. You need world-class people with, uh, with lots of time to be able to figure out how to do tiny little optimizations. And this often means that they build their own databases or they build their own software. And the only way they can attract the right talent is to allow them to open source it and go back and it's almost like academic publishing. You know, it's a way of getting respect and credentials in the software engineering world is to publish your work as open source. Right. OK. And you mentioned uh, offline here about Google doing the same thing with one, one of one of their platforms. So, I mean, a lot of people put down the birth of big data style technology to Google and their uh, MapReduce algorithm. Yeah. Um, and Yahoo. I can't remember if it came out of Yahoo or, or Google right now. But uh, that might be one of the bits you want to cut. <laughs> <laughs> it, let's, let's keep that in. It was Google. I remember you uh, told me Google. Yeah. yeah. So both of them did a lot of work on this. It's called Massively Parallel Processing, so right. MPP. In data warehousing terms, if you go back to the 80s and 90s, there was two ways of looking at solutions here. And vendors sold either an SMP, symmetrical multiprocessing, okay. or they sold an MPP type of solution. The guys in Google... Um, they built thousands and thousands of um, search crawler um, machines that would run their crawlers and, and collate all the data. So they had to build a query system that would allow them to work across thousands of machines mm. that stored the indexes of their, their web crawling. So they had to invent or, or they had to take a traditional 
query mechanism and figure out how do you break that down and allow you to run it for thousands of boxes or tens of thousands of boxes or yep. even hundreds of thousands of boxes now. Um, and this became their barrier to entry, right? They had better index data on the web than anybody else, but everybody knew how their page rank um, formally worked. Yeah. Um, their barrier to entry, if you like, was the investment they made on this, um, you know, okay. tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of boxes. So if anybody else wanted to get into the search space, they had to buy all this CapEx, this hardware, they had to make this investment in hardware. But to make it efficient and have really, really fast search results, they had to figure out how do you divide a query and run it on tens of thousands of boxes yeah. uh, at the same time and come back with the best results and, and rank them to present back out to the user. So they had to move away from the traditional approach mm. um, and symmetrical processing is more like a mainframe style approach to doing bigger queries. Whereas they said, no, no, we want to have standardized hardware as many boxes as possible, and then we want to be able to run a query on all of those boxes at the same time. So this is the MPP style architecture. Yep. Um, so they developed some software, and because they open so source that software, Everyone. a whole ecosystem of stuff has, has oh, been okay. built up around that over the last 10, 12 years. And that's what people call big data now. They are not actually talking about the data or what it does. They're probably talking about these layers of open source software, a lot of it now in, in the Apache Foundation, that allow you to work these queries across lots and lots of cheap boxes. Wow, wow, well, there you go. So let's go back to uh, the investments that you've made. Uh, you've got Endemo and Tweakaboo, which are in the mobile ethnography space. What What is mobile ethnography? So basically, it's the study of people or populations uh, in their location. Mm. So uh, a lot of digital agencies are very specialized on helping existing businesses figure out how to develop new products and how to sell them to um, existing or new customers. Um, there's a big focus group industry where people would put subjects for study okay. into a room um, and watch how they interact with a product or a packaging or whatever it might be. Yeah. So this is the whole um, study of new products and how you launch them and wh what people feel or think about them. But as soon as you take people out of their natural setting, which is ethnography, um, and you put them into a false mm. situation and give them certain tasks to carry out, the behaviors change. So yeah. it's, all, it's already not natural. Indemo is a solution to that, if you like, in that it's trying to help people to do more product research through a, a mobile video app. Right. So it's like a selfie photograph or a selfie video, um, but you can give uh, people a certain number of tasks so the idea is that researchers would organize a, a little sample population of people to investigate, you know, do you like Bacardi drinks, for example? Mm. And they'd ask them to, you know, uh, send us a selfie video of yourself um, opening a bottle of Bacardi or taking a drink from your Bacardi or mm. uh, samples of your night out when you're drinking Bacardi, for example. Yeah. So then they get real research data in loco from a very natural environment. They would people, be rewarded for that. Yes, uh, there's so some sort of business model around that. They, so the companies that are doing the research will have some way of incentivizing because I, I was just wondering if it's 2 a.m. <laughs> why would somebody want to pull out the phone and do it but so <laughs> there's Maybe. obviously other ways of incentivizing right. um, people to do that but Indemo isn't in the business of creating its own sample population so they don't recruit and um, sell it's populations what they do is just sell the, the, a workflow the management platform. video Perfect. platform okay for agencies and freelancers oh, okay, to allow them to do this research and present it back to the, the big brand right. names. So okay. it really is, um, it's like carpenter tools for freelancers and small agencies that specialize in this work. Well, th that model works because they would focus on what they do best, right? Which is create the platform, make it work efficiently, and then agencies can use it however they want. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think uh, certain types of startups need to figure out how to do something better, faster, and cheaper. Mm. So if it's three times better, three times faster, three times cheaper, then you're 27x better than the competitors. Right. So, you know, it sounds almost trite, but if you can figure out how to offer an almost equivalent service or better service um, at a fraction of the price, yeah. you're guaranteed success. But it can't be 50% better or even 100% better. It has to be, you know, 10 times better. So it doesn't have to be better. If it's 10 times cheaper, then that might be fine as well. Mm. But between a better product or a cheaper product or a faster product, you need to be hitting a 10x in savings to really force change in the industry. And I think Indemo is one of those things that can, it is at least 10x better 
and its competitors. Now, it took us quite some time to figure out that that's what we wanted to do um, mm. because you're always afraid that you're leaving value on a table yeah. as a startup and you're trying to figure out, you know, what's the right way to price? Am I, am I leaving value behind? And these can be antagonizing decisions for startups. But at a certain level, if you know you can become 10x better than everybody else, then you're better off trying to invent and create your business so that it is 10 times better, that it is better, faster and cheaper. Okay, so what I'm just sort of trying to draw patterns from, from our conversation so far, it seems to me that you have a philosophy of trying to pursue the area or the field which you're best equipped at. Um, so what you mentioned earlier about education, you had a lot of experience in the sphere of education, therefore you invested in education businesses. But also here, I'm going to ask you the question of, is this your investment thesis then? You know, do you do you follow the better, cheaper, faster route? And is, is that how you sort of grade and, and judge a business before you invest? I think better, fees, better, faster, cheaper is something that I've learned, especially with Indemo, as we were trying to figure out, you know, what kind of a startup did we want it to be and mm. what was the best way of building momentum? Uh, there are others where I don't necessarily look at it like that and I don't necessarily have expertise or background in. So one example is Shoutapp in Manchester. Okay. Um, and this is a bunch of young guys that are building a, a location app. Yep. And their view of the world is that nobody really does a good information marketplace um, for people on the go. Um, so this is an example of uh, a, a startup where I effectively invested in the quality of the people because we don't offer them any kind of technical know-how. They specialize uh, in tech that we're not specialists in. Right. So in from a technical, and they're very, very technical as a startup team. So I have nothing to offer them in terms of technical know-how. Okay. Um, I really like their story. I think it's an example of something that it's not going to be a small business. If it's successful, it'll be super successful. Scalable. Massively scalable. Right. A, a global platform. And basically, they want to create this new future uh, location platform for people to offer services and for ordinary consumers to opt into stuff that they're interested in. Yeah. So it's a, a mountain for them to climb. But I, I believe that if anybody can do it, especially here in, in the UK, I think these guys have a very good shot at it. <laughs> okay, so shout out app for, for people shout that want to search it. App. Shout out app. Shout app. app. Perfect. So I think it's almost ad hoc basis then. Some some investments you've made based on the people and some investments based on the technology. So do you typically invest in businesses where you could bring some technology to them? Uh, yes, yeah, like that would be our bias. Uh, if we know something about it, either the marketplace mm. or the policy, if it's uh, in a government sector, then we would like to bring that know-how. So if we know and understand the space a little bit, we can help a startup in their space. Um, where possible, we like to bring some technology because I, we do see people make mistakes or repeat things that we think are wrong. So mm. if we can help them, we will try and help them. Yeah. yeah but at the same time, we want people to have the flexibility for them to decide what they need to do. So um, yeah, at different points in times with different startups, we've had disagreements. But where there's a disagreement on how something should be done from a technology point of view, we always have to take a back seat because yep. it's not our startup. We don't own the most of the equity. So we have to let startups make their own decisions. Yeah. Um, the best we can do is, is just give them the benefit of our experience and expertise. And if they don't follow it. It's typically not because of the technology reasons, but there might be other reasons for it, shall we say. With regards to security, I'm guessing being in the data game and the internet technology, security is, is extremely important, but you, you're also invested in that space as well and you've created security technologies? Yeah. Um, again, there's not really a huge design in the background. Um, from a big data perspective, I'm obviously interested in uh, internet of things as a way of you know streaming relatively large amounts of data. So. I have an ear that's kind of attuned to watching for and picking out those opportunities when they come by. So yep. Texuna Integrated Security um, Systems is an example of that, where we found a couple of people that are uh, big or, or worked with some of the bigger um, uh, companies in security. Mm. Uh, this is physical security in CCTV and physical access management systems, so door controls and, and stuff like that. So I was interested in that, not because I care about CCTV or, you know, door management, but okay. because I was really interested in that kind of a business as a way of collecting data and managing facilities. Right. So, for example, I've talked to a university here in, in London 
that uh, you know had over 20,000 rooms so facilities management uh, is a huge challenge for them yeah. and you know there, it, there's a very interesting question about what kind of data can you get about all of those 20,000 rooms that allows you to understand how well they're being used you know what is the the mm. utilization or yeah. the yield that yeah. you get out of of um, each facility and do you even need these buildings because some of them they own more of them they just lease yeah. but yeah. if they can make a 5% improvement in their uh, management of those facilities, they might be able to get rid of leases that are very, very expensive that in central amazing. London. That makes so, perfect sense. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm very interested in the space because I think it's interesting anyway. I'm very interested in online security. So being able to link that with um, offline security, let's say, because everything offline is going online anyway. Um, you can overlap some of these layers of information to get higher levels of confidence about who people are or where they are and whether or not there's a third party hacker imitating them somewhere else, for yeah. example. Yeah. So I think that that collision of the real world uh, and the digital world is very interesting. Uh, and it's a way of, of me being able to stay involved in that and understanding what the opportunities are between the two. That is fascinating. I mean, I um, so last year there was a gym I used to go to and um, I only realized a year after going there regularly that I could actually log online and find out exactly when I visited the gym what time and for how long I've been there for. Mm. And I realize that I am a creature of habit. I, I realize that I go there at a specific time, almost, you know, on a daily basis. And just to look back at that, it's, it's interesting to, to, to guess, trying to draw some lessons out of it. But in the case when you can actually make financial decisions based on that, like the university example is phenomenal. I mean, it took us here for the studio we're at now. I think we walked through just under four doors where I had to scan a card just to get into. It would make perfect sense for you to determine that one of those rooms or this building is the least utilized building out of everything else and it's not needed as much. Therefore, if you remove it, you make a saving of X amount. Yeah, yeah. So like the world is made up of real things. Uh, and I think uh, it's very hard sometimes for people to understand that the data world and the digital world, especially you now with... Um, uh, virtual reality and stuff that yeah. there is a, a, a real world with trillions of dollars in circulation okay. uh, and everything costs money. Uh, so I've spent some time in Brazil in the physical mining business. And when you look at projects, you look at what is the capex or the capital investment expenditure required mm -hmm. to build a project? What is the operational expenditure or opex required to maintain that project over its lifetime? And what is the return you get as a result? Uh, if when you sell your products and uh, or services or whatever it might be, what kind of return do you get that will pay back the capex that you invest? So, in the traditional world, the investment decision making criteria is very structured and it's very very well done, um, and they're hyper optimized to understand the impact of inflation, foreign exchange, and and all these things. If you go look at a business plan for a startup, it doesn't have any of that stuff, and yeah. it's almost meaningless anyway because. The evidence isn't there to justify a lot of the numbers. Yeah. So it is more like an investment in hope. So yeah, that makes it slash hard. people. This is what so I'm hence not, the yeah. people yeah. bit yeah. is really important. Yeah, more important. I guess almost so you mentioned position. earlier about the technology. Normally, technology. I don't. I, well, I would never invest in technology per se. I, I don't think technology itself is particularly interesting unless you've got world class specialists who are creating that technology. So. If you're in blockchain and you're investing in protocols and the guys that are delivering the protocol are amazing, then you've got an investment case potentially. But yeah. on average, if somebody came up and offered me a blockchain, I'd be like, pass. <laughs> okay. So before we go into blockchain, because there is an interesting conversation about that, um, mining, mining interest in South America. Um, you, just, you just mentioned now about how your investment philosophy in there. Um, would work, but you you do have a success story in, in that in that space. Tell us about yeah. that. How did you get into it? Um, like most things, by accident, you know, not by a master design. But yeah. the one of the original investors in Texuna um, was a, a a big player in iron ore, okay. and he went to Brazil looking for an allocation from one of the largest iron ore producers in the world, Valley uh, CVRD. They were called at the time. And uh, he couldn't get any iron ore. This is back around 2005, 2006. Actually, it was around 2004, 2005. So he asked me to, so he, he got introduced to a greenfield project. Um, What's a greenfield project? A greenfield project is just a, a hill or a mountain mm -hmm. in the middle of Brazil. And someone says, there be iron ore in them there hills. <laughs> okay. So that's a greenfield project by definition almost. Okay, simple. Um, yeah, pretty simple. Uh, so the guy tries to sell it for $100 million. And how much information? So my job was to go there. Um, um, 
and help them have a look around and eventually um, manage a team and organize taking it from a, a hill mm. to a study with some information about the hill. So going there, doing some drilling, pulling out core and creating a statistical database that could tell you what actually was in the hill and then do the engineering cost estimations and so on to tell you how much it would cost to move that mountain from Brazil to China so that they could make steel in China. How similar is this to oil drilling? Same thing. So any kind of natural resources type of business is about um, having a so-called asset. Mm. So um, I think it was Mark Twain to find a mine as a, a hole in the ground with a liar on top. So <laughs> this is what I'm saying. A green okay. field at the very, very start yeah. is just a story somebody is selling you. Uh, there's iron ore in that there hill. Somebody has to make the investment to go and change that story from being a lot of hot air to evidence. So the more you drill it, the more confident you get on two things. It's a binary outcome. There is iron ore or there isn't iron ore. If there is, you then have to figure out, is it economic? Does it make sense to take it out? Because iron ore literally is uh, a case of moving a mountain from one continent to another. Wow. Uh, you're, you're taking the supply and you're moving it to where the demand is. Yeah. So there's huge optimizations required to do that. Yeah. Was it a worthwhile investment for you then to, to be there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, my my boss and shareholder made an awful lot of money out of it. Uh, when we uh, finally exited, it had a $1.5 billion market valuation for this project. Wow. Still as a greenfield. Now, it did cost $250 million of investment to do all of the engineering and convert it from a story to a, a feasibility study, a bankable feasibility study where the numbers were rock solid. It was based on science, not storytelling. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a, a mega outcome really. What are your thoughts just generally on the, you know, the rare earth minim I, I should metals? I should give the name of it in case anybody ever wants to go look at it. Yeah. But the project was Bahia Mineração in Bahia in Brazil. Okay, well, that's the name. Anyone can search that. And is this an interesting space, do you say? Is it accessible to everybody? I mean, what are your thoughts? Because obviously you are in the technology sphere now in Mayfair, London, but that is South American metal mining. It's, it sounds completely different to me. What are your thoughts? What's the difference? I think there's great parallels, actually, and I think the I spent um, eight or nine years in Brazil and specifically working on this large scale project. I spent five or six years and it taught me a lot about the investment discipline for very large scale projects. So when we talk about startups, everybody thinks a successful startup is something that gets sold for 10 or 20 or 30 million. But in reality, what you really want to do is be the next Google. You want to be the next billion dollar business or the next 10 billion dollar yeah, business. Absolutely. And when you look at it in that context, there's a lot of storytelling. There's some evidence gathering. So you have to make, you know, tens of millions of dollars of an investment to get the evidence to prove the story. So the story is just a person telling you something. Mm. You invest tens of millions of dollars to go from story to some evidence. So that means helping a startup get up and running, get its software together, get its first customers, show whether or not there's momentum. And the really good ones will have momentum and they're the ones that you then pile in all the cash. That's yeah. when you go from five or 10 million absolutely um, speculative capital investment into, oh, can I build a scientific story that a certain amount of capital investment um, at X spend or OPEX will result, result in a Y return. Fascinating that's what the parallels. Big, that's that's <laughs> when the big guys come along and say, yeah, they, they look at it quite um, scientifically. So yeah. they'll want to know the numbers and the momentum and, and so on. Uh, and that's when you know it's a proper, well-structured big guys game. So from mining in South America to mining cryptocurrencies, you yeah. are now in the blockchain space? Where, well, I've certainly looked at it uh, quite a lot over the last five or six years. Uh, I think um, this idea of stories and understanding that you know lots of stories go bad and the evidence isn't there to, to back them up has made me relatively conservative as well in terms of startups. So mm. unless I know a lot or can help, I'm fairly reluctant to get involved in new projects. Right. But crypto, I have done a lot of research on it and I do really like some of the fundamental tenets underneath blockchain and Bitcoin and consensus management in a, in, in a network where there's no reason why anybody should trust each other. So I, I've been fascinated by it, but I never had the uh, speculative nature to go and buy lots of Bitcoin or anything like that. Mm. Um, I am involved in a startup called Zodiacs right now, and we have looked at three or four different um, strategies in the space. Mining is obviously one. Mm. Uh, and to me, mining is is 
the closest thing that you can get to building a business case for investing X amount of money to get Y return. Right. Where OPEX, the cost of maintaining the, the capital hardware, yep. uh, is defined and some locations are cheaper than others. So mm. you won't run a mining operation here in UK or in Ireland, but if you can get a cheap energy deal in Paraguay or in Russia, then you'd be a fool not to go there and set up a, a, a big mining farm because uh, you can return relatively large um, yields if you look at it as a coupon like a bank. Yeah. You buy something at face value and you get a coupon or a return on it every year into maybe not perpetuity because the life of a lot of this hardware in crypto mining is maybe only three or four or five years at most. Wow. But I do look at it as a, as a platform that produces a yield and as long as that yield is interesting enough, which depends on the price of the cryptocurrencies that you're mining. But yeah. as long as that yield is interesting, I do think uh, it's an interesting place to be. From my perspective, it just sounds data driven. Um, you know, you're attracted to the numbers. You want something where you can see numbers. You're not really attracted to speculation. If you can tell me how much I put in and how much I get out, you know, I'm interested. Yeah. So lots of people will say, oh, is, is Bitcoin a fraud or is it for, you know, drug dealers and uh, money laundering? I don't subscribe to any of that nonsense because that's a typical... Uh, institutional style response to something they don't know, don't understand. They watch out for bad stories, but they don't have the wherewithal to understand what the potential upside is. I see huge potential upside, but I do think that a lot of the technology... What is the upside, sorry? The upside is, I, I think that the um, benefits of using blockchain for certain scenarios, it, it can be quite widespread in lots of different areas. Um, so I do see it being rolled out extensively. But I don't necessarily see value in blockchain technology, monetarily speaking, as in it's open source. Anybody can deploy a ch blockchain if they so wish. So I see it as becoming uh, another protocol that we can work with um, or another piece of open sor source software that we can apply to a, a problem to solve it. Um, so the value isn't necessarily in the software. But I do think that there's a lot of um, businesses today run on the Internet that will eventually migrate some of what they do to blockchain style scenarios rather than having big centralized servers. Right. And has Zodiacs then fully decided it will be on the mining side of things? No, no. We, we've, we've looked at a couple of different strategies and we're, let's say we're at the experimental lab stage. So we're looking at different things. Um, mining, I kind of like, but again, everything depends on what the price of any particular crypto is. One of the ones I'm really interested in is Sia coin as a storage um, network. I think it's very interesting to see how uh, decentralized storage mm. uh, may compete against somebody like AWS or Azure or anybody else. How do you spell that? SIA coin? S-I-A. S-I-A. And Sia how they're doing things differently? So basically what they're doing is, uh, you'll probably have heard of peer-to-peer -peer file okay. sharing. P2P. Um, so a lot of blockchain is ultimately peer-to-peer -peer at a massive scale. So in Bitcoin, uh, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, but every node shares everything in terms of the data on the blockchain. I think in storage, uh, nobody wants to store data on Bitcoin. You're not going to put your uh, album of music um, records and stuff like that on, on a blockchain because it's not really scalable for that. Right. But you can use a blockchain to verify that somebody else is storing it as they said they would. Okay. So you can use hashing technology to go back and verify that they still have that data. So... Uh, the idea of SiaCoin is that they will create economic incentives for people to store data. Mm. They'll obviously store multiple copies of it, but they're not going to store it on every single node in the network. Right. So they'll use blockchain and hashing to confirm that, you know, a dozen people or two dozen people or 10 dozen people are storing the data and are verifying that they still have it and it's up to date. And the person who is uh, providing their data into the network for cheap storage will pay for it using Sire coins. So that's an example of a utility right. that I, I see as being potentially extremely successful. So as we're recording this, it's April 2018. And um, being the data expert that you are, um, GDPR must be something which you're looking into. Can you maybe tell listeners what GDPR is? Um, when is it coming to effect? And what are the implications? Um, general data protection regulation. Uh, Actually, the, the timing is amazing because GDPR has been around for a little while. And I think the Americans probably saw the Europeans as being pain in the ass socialists uh, coming in with GDPR as a set of legislation. It's becoming effective this year in May. Um, and they probably saw it as a way of creating barriers against uh, American 
big data companies or, you know, the Facebooks and Googles and, and Amazon and so on. Um, and, you know, Europe isn't the first place to do this. If you look at Russia, Russia already brought in this idea that uh, personal data of Russian citizens must stay in Russia. Wow. So it's not like Europe is, is leading the pack in this kind of ideology. But obviously they look at Russia and say, oh, that's just Big Brother being silly. We mm. don't like Russia. <laughs> but Europe is doing exactly the same thing. They're saying, well, they had an old arrangement called Safe Harbor, which kind of said ah, American and Europe like each other. So we respect each other's laws. So it's OK for European data go, to go to America. GDPR is putting more restrictions on that. So they're saying that if any data goes abroad, that um, there has to be a lot more controls ar around how European citizens can get access to those um, American custodians of their data, if you like. Yeah. Uh, but also it's saying that personally identifiable information shouldn't leave Europe anymore, um, not even in encrypted format. Wow. So what they're doing is they're kind of shining a light over how this industry works, because this is a massive industry that affects everybody's lives. Mm. And I think in terms of timing, I was, I was mentioning... Um, the example of Cambridge Analytica yep. and Facebook is yep. a perfect example of something that we've all known, people in the industry have known for the last four or five years. And that is that social networks have amassed an incredible amount of data. They follow you everywhere you go without you even knowing it. And they make an extremely large amount of that data available to any third party who signs up to, to integrate with these big players. Wow. So I actually think... GDPR doesn't do enough. I think it's just a slight tweak oh. on existing data protection laws. For me, I think um, you know the, the five biggest companies in the world are very technology and data oriented. Apple, arguably, is the only one of them that has a closed ecosystem. So even though they use and abuse your data as much as possible, it's closed within their network. Right. The other guys like the Googles and the Facebooks and the LinkedIn, I, I think their behavior uh, and their their respect for the data is a lot less. And I'll back that up with an example. Personally, I think it should be illegal that Facebook or Google or Amazon or any of these other big data um, uh, digital businesses, I don't think any of them should provide identity services and authentication services mm. to anybody in the internet because I see it as a major conflict of interest. They provide a free service to allow people to do single sign-on. You can use your LinkedIn ID or your Google ID to link into or to log into any gaming platform that you use or to log into your um, your almost anything e-learning yeah. websites. Like this is the same in Alison. Alison.com allows people to sign in with their social IDs. Mm. Now, Alison doesn't take um, very much data from these social logins, but if they wanted to, they could. Wow. And lots of other people are, and not just your information, but your friend's information. And this is what people have discovered with Cambridge Analytica. So from my point of view, I think that it's a huge conflict of interest for these guys to give you free tools and services like identity and um, uh, single sign-on, because they're using that as a way, they're subsidizing it basically to give it to you at zero price so that they can then use that to gather more data about you as you interact with other properties on the web. Yeah. So I think that's very, very wrong. And I think there's only two ways of fixing this. And this is a five to 10 year problem. I think um, identity should be provided by identity specialists, okay. not by big incumbents that have a conflict of interest. Mm. Um, I also think that potentially the decentralization idea that blockchain is bringing or is based on yep. can potentially help people resolve this as well. So just like Sia coin and Filecoin and storage can help you move your data off of these centralized networks into a peer to peer way with full certainty that the data is safe. I think likewise, the same thing can happen around identity. And there are a number of different identity players looking at doing this in in different types of blockchains, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin or specialist networks. Really interesting times ahead of us, I take it. Yeah, and so identity is something I'm very interested in. We run an identity service or an identity and access management service for yeah. the, the Department of Finance here in the UK at the moment. And it allows um, schools to get access to all departmental resources in terms of um, the, the data that the, the department has from that school. Um, so we understand quite a lot about identity and the value of single sign-on. Mm. But, uh, for example, there is no way the Department for Education or a local authority or anybody like that should ever allow you to use your Facebook ID or Google ID to log in. Not because um, it's bad or wouldn't work, but because I, as a citizen, wouldn't want 
you know, my local authority getting access to all mm. of my Facebook details yeah. and my Facebook accounts yeah. and my Facebook friends and everything else that I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, data privacy, security is just this whole kind of worms in its, in its own stuff, isn't it? So there's a bunch of technology behind privacy and data protection. Um, one of the really interesting bits of science that's going on at the moment is around, um, I think it's, uh, 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 I'll have to come back to you. That's fine, that's fine. It, it, uh, if you the name it, of it, is, it'll come to me in a minute, okay. but, but it's a very specific science that allows um, people like Microsoft and Google and um, Apple to collect data, differential privacy, right? Okay. So the science of differential privacy is a way of collecting real world data at an extremely low level of granularity on everybody right. and then mixing it with noise or regenerating it um, as a synthetic data set that allows them to extract the same sorts of values and meaning out of the data without but losing the ability to create or link it with other data so that you can fundamentally identify who somebody is. The problem is there's so much data out there that if 10 different organizations are collecting 10 different aspects of your life online and they're reselling it to anybody who wants to buy it and it gets joined back together, you can effectively identify who anybody is, what their healthcare ailments are, oh, okay. what their spend is, what their net worth is, what their political points of views are yeah. and so on. They can tell everything about you. They know more about you than you do yourself because you can't remember half the things you've done, but they <laughs> have a, an infinite memory. And they have a way of predicting what you might do in the future because they've already seen other people like you do it. So we all we already live in this kind of scary big brother world. Um, yeah. Go back and read a couple of books. Um, the Huxley book, um, A Brave New World and um, 1984. Th these are great books mm. and this stuff already exists. It already exists. That's fascinating. So, uh, Patrick, uh, you have had a, an exciting career uh, so far, and it seems to me that like there's so much more exciting things happening in the future. Um, what what would you say? I mean, what would your advice be? Um, how how did you manage to get involved in so many interesting projects? You know, the data, technology, angel investing in a variety of, of areas, mining in South South America. And um, is there? Would you say what top tips would you give? to somebody that's aspiring to, to become the next Patrick Lynch? Uh, well, I'm not sure I'm the best role model. Um, <laughs> I have a long way to go yet. But what I would say to people is, um, you know, never be afraid because uh, I was looking at a YouTube video recently of the guy, um, you know, the film Catch Me If You Can. OK, yeah. Pilot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the real world guy that was behind that um, uh, gave some lectures and he gave a great yeah. Google talk recently that, that I saw. And he kept saying, you know, none of what he did was by design, and nor was it on purpose. Right. He always had a short term need. Um, and when an opportunity presented itself, he just took it. So I think life isn't about a plan. In fact, arguably life is over if the plan is already written up. I think <laughs> the whole idea is go and explore, keep your eyes and your ears open. Over time, your eyes and your ears get better at telling you what is really an opportunity and what isn't. But never be afraid. I think... Um, the most, most of the well-educated um, people that I know are very good at taking safe options and doing the right thing and doing the right career. And, you know, they do extremely well out of it. And if that's what excites you, well and good. But if you, if you are willing um, to not know what happens tomorrow or where it goes, but are willing to look at interesting opportunities, do it. Absolutely do it. You never know where it's going to take you. On that point, Patrick, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I've re really enjoyed speaking to you. I think there's um, so many interesting nuggets of information that we'll be able to extract from this episode. And uh, yeah, that was an episode with Patrick Lynch, CEO and founder of Texuna, T-E-X-U-N-A, uh, and also an angel investor in a variety of uh, platforms, uh, internet businesses, and uh, other mining interests. Uh, I was your host, Amin Siala. This was an episode of the Imperial College Business Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and on iTunes and soon on SoundCloud. Thanks a lot for listening or watching. Take care and uh, tune in for another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.